snow day. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of cold temperatures. I'm glad that everyone survived the frigid temperatures here and made it this evening. And I know you probably had to drive through some snow drifts and so forth to get here, but we'll probably be all right. Good to see you this evening. Good to see everybody with some smiles on your faces. And what an encouragement it actually is to have an opportunity uh, just to meet in the midweek and have the opportunity to fellowship with each other, but more importantly, to actually have a preaching service. Have you ever noticed that in our church we don't call our Wednesday night service Bible study? Uh, it's not because we don't study the Bible on Wednesday nights, but I think that there's something that happened years ago in the churches where preaching services and worship services just kind of went away. And uh, the, the de-emphasis of it, you, know, you can do Bible study anywhere. You don't really need to get together with the believers for that. We kind of lost something there. So we do have prayer at the end of the uh, service on Wednesday nights, but we want to have the preaching of the Word of God be one of the things that is a major part of our services, one of our distinctives. We will be beginning in a couple of weeks a series on biblical separation, and I think that probably it is one of the least uh, comprehended Bible truths really in Christianity today. I am almost on a daily basis surprised. And I guess it's a sign of, of being old. I think my wife and I were talking about yesterday, we were talking about some of the things, you know, the 20 year olds, not, not anybody in here, the ones that weren't in here, some habits that they have. And I said, you remember being young and having, having old people talk about kids these days? And <laughs> talking about, you know, kids these days, kids these days. And uh, I think we're old, I think is what my conclusion of that was. But really, honestly, I'm surprised today that believers with regard to worldliness haven't got a clue about being in the world and not of the world. And it's something that we need to, as a church, have a handle on. We're not going to approach it from a perspective of, here's a list of rules that you need to adhere to in order to be a member of our church. Luke, are they still banging the basketball out there? You better shut them down, boy. They are not supposed to be doing that. Tell them, come inside or hit the road. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I told him to do, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, thank you, Luke. That's taken care of. Anyway, so we're going to be we're going to be having a series, and I'm actually thinking about shifting some things so that can be a Sunday morning uh, series. And so I want to let you know about that. And then also, it may not have slipped up on you like it has for me, but did you know that it's about the time of the year that we celebrate the triumphal entry into Jerusalem? You know, I was just thinking today about how that Jesus Christ deliberately went to Jerusalem to die. That's an amazing concept, isn't it? He just, it's time for me to go to Jerusalem. Went there to die for sins and laid his life down for us. And I'd encourage you as a believer to reflect on the deliberate sacrifice that God made so that we could be redeemed to Him. How deliberate God's love is. You know, I think for many of us, spur of the moment, we might stand a better chance of doing the right thing sometimes than if we have to think about it. You ever have to work yourself up to a major decision? You, have, you make a major decision and then you have time to think about it before you actually go through with it? And you realize, wow, oh, <laughs> and you realize it's not <laughs> you realize you know wow you know this is a major decision that I made you know God before he made man had made the decision to redeem man to himself and it was no haphazard casual circumstance by which Christ went to Jerusalem to die for our sins if ever a person ought to feel loved it ought to be this season of the year when we realize that Jesus went to the cross on purpose to demonstrate God's love for us. And so let's celebrate it this year. Make sure to let folks know if this is the time of the year that they will fellowship and go to church. I encourage them to. Let me encourage you to go to church on the season of the year, the time of the year that we celebrate the resurrection. I don't want to rant about this because I have the last couple of years and it hasn't done a bit of good. But it does break my heart that believers actually celebrate the resurrection by not being in church. 
today. You say, Pastor, no, we all go to church. No, actually what happens nowadays most of the time is a family that doesn't go to church at all invites everybody to come to their house for dinner at about noon or 1 o'clock on uh, Resurrection Sunday. And people that regularly go to church instead of bringing their family members to church skip church or come to Sunday school and skip or don't go Sunday evening. They go to church less. They fellowship less on the Lord's Day. And it just seems so backward to me. It seems as though the Lord's Day ought to mean more to us. Worship of God ought to mean more to us. And so don't buy into the redefining of the resurrection. And uh, so I, well, let me just, I just, that's for free, and that's something I'd urge you about. Uh, Luke, why don't you come up here and help with the offering tonight, will you please? I would ask him to pray, but I'm afraid of what he's going to say after telling the teams to hit the road. So we'll pray now. Don't. <laughs> God curses on those that don't give. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Let's pray and we'll ask the Lord to bless. Uh, Father, thank you so much tonight for the opportunity to worship you through giving. And Lord, we recognize this evening that there aren't just requirements for us, but that God, it's accepted according to that a man hath, and that not according to that he hath not. And really it's more of a matter of, of stewardship, of faith, and of grace. And really it's just such a privilege to be able to worship you through giving. And so we ask that tonight as we give that the offering literally would be an offering to you and that you'd be pleased by it and that you'd be glorified by it. And Lord, that you bless those that give this evening. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. song, hymn number 414. Hymn number 414, Am I a Soldier of the Cross? Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 this evening. So in, in your New Testament of the Scripture, that would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then 1 Corinthians will be next. Probably about three-fourths of the way through your Bible, uh, if you, you're just looking for it that way. If you don't have a Bible with you, a copy of the Scripture, there are plenty of those available, and so please don't, uh, don't do without the copy of the Scripture this evening. I want to look at one simple truth this evening from the Scripture that's so foundational, actually, that if you overlook it, it'll be a hindrance to you, and if you comprehend it, it will enable you. There are, are actually, you know, you'd think that there would be only one simple truth that everything kind of 
rest on in the Christian life, but there are a lot of them, aren't there? Simple truths that if you overlook, they'll be they'll be stumbling blocks. They'll be besetting uh, besetting sins or besetting circumstances. But the great thing about simple truths, first of all, is the profundity of them. Something profound is something that is really never complicated, but that is just so true that it rings true in a very, very broad spectrum. And the truth we're going to look at this evening would be that. And so if you look down at verse 26, I want to just read verses 26 and 27 this evening, and then I'll spend a few minutes, or we'll pray and I'll spend a few minutes insulting you and we'll get into our text this evening. So here we go. Uh, it's part of the text. It's part of the context. First Corinthians chapter one. Did I say chapter one? Yeah, First Corinthians chapter one. You said verse twenty-six. Yes. Sophia knows what I said. Okay. <laughs> For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And we could read on, but let's just look down to verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence. So let's pray. Father, please help us this evening, and help us to grasp this simple, profound truth that God is really everything when it comes to living life and seeing ourselves from the correct perspective. But God is more than that. It really, because you made us, it's really the key in, in, in all of life, not just as a believer, but even in our workplace and in every place. So I pray that you would help us with these truths. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, said I would spend a little bit of time insulting you. You know, 2018 is the year of kindness for me. Uh, so, no, uh, I'm just going to be as nice as I possibly can. But this is a passage of the Scripture uh, that really lays it out there. I, matter of fact, the first time I really, uh, the first time I really meditated on this portion of the Scripture, I had to just kind of chuckle at how direct the Scripture actually is and what the Scripture is actually saying to the reader. The first time I really meditated on 1 Corinthians, I think would possibly, probably be maybe my uh, senior year, no, junior year of high school. I memorized I memorized 1 Corinthians and part of 2 Corinthians for Bible quiz for our school. So there, we, there would, we'd have a Bible quiz team, and there would be, I think, five of us that would be on a team and two alternates. But then we would have a team captain. And the team captain always had to memorize a large portion. It always had to be a guy in our school. So there was a girl that memorized better and was a lot smarter than me. And she should have been the team captain, except the team captain had to be a guy. And so I was team captain, so I always was assigned to memorize a lot. And so you had to memorize the scripture well enough that it wasn't just a matter of when they, in the Bible quiz, when they would say, According to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, you couldn't just jump up and quote the verse. Anybody could do that, actually. Anybody could jump up, and if once they've heard the reference, if they've memorized it well enough, you wouldn't even have to be fast on your feet or think or understand the verse. You know, a lot of times we memorize Scripture, uh, and we don't even really meditate on the Scripture. And those two go hand in hand. And I would say to you that probably when I memorize the Scripture, I could quote it word for word, no mistakes. But it never really sunk into me what the Apostle Paul was saying to the church at Corinth until probably uh, a couple of years later in my teen years. And when it really sunk into me what the Scripture was saying, it made me kind of laugh and it also humbled me. Let me say about humility that humility is not a person acting as though uh, or acting modestly about their accomplishments. In other words, when we talk about someone being humble, a lot of times we are thinking this person is so impressive and yet they act very modest in spite of the fact that they're impressive. And you know, that isn't so far from the truth of humility, but humility actually isn't that. You know what humility actually is? Humility, humility is a realization of what you actually are. 
in light of God's Word. In other words, a person who has humility doesn't have any trouble acting as though he isn't anything really important uh, when he realizes that he is a sinner and that the only redeeming quality about him is the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ which covers our sins. Isn't it true? I mean, when you really spend time realizing what you are in light of the Scripture, all of a sudden any comparison which could be made between yourself and someone who doesn't do so well by comparison, all of a sudden that becomes rather unimportant, insignificant, doesn't it? I mean, you may do better than someone else, but when you meditate on the truth that the Bible says when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And you realize that your qualification to be redeemed to God is not your talent, your works, your accomplishments. It's that you're ungodly. I mean, literally, God doesn't save. Do you remember what Jesus said specifically about this? He said, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What's the qualification for anyone that God saves? Do you have to be a sinner? Okay, so how does God see me? He, he's the one that formed me. He knows what I am, and what am I? Yeah, ungodly. Ungodly. Well, that isn't very impressive. And when I, when I have a view of life through the lens of the reality that I'm without strength, and I'm ungodly, I don't have to work very hard on pretending to be humble. Or in spite of my accomplishments and all the things, all of my achievements, in spite of those things being down to earth. All it takes to get me down to earth is to realize God is holy and I am unclean. And that really is a reality. Do you know that that concept, though, is something I think that we realize on and off as believers, but it's something that we soon get away from when we begin to compare ourselves. It's really easy for us to look at certain things and make those the standard for what God sees in us. Now let me ask you a question. What are we created in Christ Jesus unto? Yes, good works, right? We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You know, this is a little bit of a misnomer. It's a little bit, I, maybe misnomer is the wrong word for it. It's a little bit of a, um, of a catch-22, if you will. Before you're saved, what are your good works? Filthy rags. Yeah, they're unrighteousness, the filthy rags, right? After you're saved, what are you created unto? Good works. Do good works matter? Yes. Yeah. Well, it just depends on the perspective, whether you're saved or lost. But if you're saved, you are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, God made you to do good works. And it's because of the cross that you can do so. And good works absolutely do matter. Is God aware of your works? Is He keeping record of your works? And you know, if you carefully study the Scripture, you say, yes, indeed, He actually is. Matter of fact, uh, Paul's letters to, to the church at Corinth indicate that very, very specifically. So it does matter what we do, doesn't it? But sometimes it seems as though, okay, I've been doing the works, and now, you know, I have some accomplishments. And when we get out of touch with reality, we start thinking of ourselves as something. Now, I'm not going to preach all about what Paul is talking about here in the first several chapters in the church at Corinth, but really, to just summarize, he is addressing... He's addressing a problem in the church where the believers are divided on the basis of leadership. And it's not because the leadership are creating the division. It's just that they are kind of picking their leader and in a very, very prideful way rejecting the other leaders. In, in chapter 1 and, and verse 1, Paul said, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. And I remember memorizing this passage of Scripture and thinking, okay, if I'm going to choose, which one would I say I'm of? Right? I'm going to be in the Christ crowd. And I used to be a little confused by that because it seemed, according to the context, as though there was a rebuke for the people included in the category that said that they were of Christ. And I always thought, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with just being a follower of Jesus? 
Since then, I've met a lot of those people, though. I've met followers of Jesus. I knock on their door. I try to share the gospel with them, and they'll let me know that they that they've heard the gospel and that they've received it, and then they'll let me know that they are a wonderful Christian. You know, an example for the believers. And I'll ask them where they fellowship at, what church that they're a part of, and they'll say, I don't go to church. I just I just think churches are full of those people, you know, hypocrites. I just think, I don't... And then they'll tell you, I just follow Jesus. I just follow Jesus. It used to be that that stymied me a little bit. I thought, uh, what do you tell somebody that says they don't want to follow men? Because I know men are imperfect. I know the men in our church are imperfect. So what do I say to somebody that says, I don't go there because I follow a perfect Savior and I'm not going to you know, be part of an imperfect bunch of people? And uh, the reality of it, though, is that Paul really addresses it here. See, these individuals have rejected God's authority. See, when you reject Christ's church, you've rejected whose, whose institution? Whose idea was the church? Jesus. Jesus kind of had, that was, that was sort of Jesus' pet project. That's probably not a very nice way of putting it, is it? It was Jesus' idea, wasn't it, to, to found His church? He's the rock. And the church is going to be built on Him, and the foundation of the church is going to be the apostles and the prophets, and the members are going to be fitly framed on that. It was Jesus' idea. Does Jesus have somewhat of a notion that His church is not perfect? Yes. That's why in Ephesians chapter 5, He says that He is going to sanctify it and cleanse it, so that He can present it unto Himself without spot or wrinkle. In other words, the church is the institution Jesus is using to sanctify and cleanse us. And so, it naturally follows that it must be full of dirty people, if they need to be cleansed. Isn't it so? Yeah. And so when you would say something like, I only follow Jesus. I just reject all organized religion and churches and such. I reject organized religion too. I understand that. But I'm going to tell you something. The church is Jesus' idea, and if you reject it, you're not insulting the church. You're not insulting sinners. You're saying, I'm of Christ, and I reject everything that He told me to do. See, see how disingenuous that is? I'm of Paul. Okay, you're following Paul. Okay, I'm of a, I'm a Paulus. I'm, I'm, Peter, I'm a Peter guy. I'm a Jesus guy. And every single attitude was wrong because God gave them Paul and Barnabas and Cephas as ministers of the Gospel. And when they rejected his ministers of the Gospel, they're rejecting him. And when you reject the church, my friend, you're rejecting Jesus. And it's just the same. It's every bit the same. Okay, so now you say, Pastor, that's not too insulting. We'll wait just a little bit. We will get there. Uh, in verse uh, 26 again, I just, and I just want to look at this because it's just so important for us. We need this. We need to hear this. I don't know, once a year, a couple times a year, or enough that it's constantly in our minds what we are. The Bible says, you see your calling, brethren. Okay, so who is Paul talking about now? Is he talking about Paul, Apollos, and Cephas? No, he's talking about the members of the church at Corinth. He's talking about the people in the seats. And so because the Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable, and so therefore applies in Fort Lauderdale, let's just call it the church of Fort Lauderdale. So now when he says, ye see your calling, brethren, he's actually specifically addressing the individuals who are sitting in your seat this evening. Like literally... Specifically, it's the person who's in your chair tonight that Paul is talking to. That's how, how this gets practical here right now. And so then he says, you see your calling, how that not many wise men after the flesh. <laughs> if this were in Ryan Price terms, it would be like, well, you guys, you know, evidently, you know, we're a bunch of idiots. You know, we're, you know, we're all surrounded with a bunch of rather unintelligent individuals tonight. Right? And that's what Paul is saying. He said, if you look around, you'll see God doesn't really use smart people because He's using you. <laughs> you see this? Wise. Just God, he says, God doesn't really need... If, if you just take a look around the room, and, and really this evening, I thought about attaching mirrors in front of everybody's yeah. chair and say, guys, look in the mirror real quick and uh, check the mirror. And if you look in the mirror, you'll see God doesn't really use wise people. <laughs> that is, that's precisely what He's saying, isn't it? Okay, now, I, I'm joking. That isn't insulting. It's actual. You know what's really comforting to me? 
to realize that I don't need to be wise in order for God to use me. God doesn't need man's wisdom. He has His own. You know, one of the greatest hindrances to God's power is man's power. One of the greatest hindrances to God's wisdom is human wisdom. For years I've been not against, I see the usefulness of it, I use it myself, I'm encouraged by it, but I've been convinced that the apologetics ministry, though it's important to know what we believe, that it's powerless. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, you can prove, can't you? At least you can disprove evolution and you can prove uh, that at least you can present a good case that there's a God who's a creator and that the earth was destroyed in a worldwide flood. There's scientific evidence, actually, for creation isn't there. And you know how many people get saved because of that? Some, I suppose, being generous. I, I don't know. Some, I suppose. But do you know what really turns people's lives and hearts around? the power of God. I mean, honestly, I don't know how many times I've had the precious opportunity to preach the Gospel to people that really were convinced in their hearts that they didn't even believe in God. And yet, because of the preaching of the Word of God, I'm serious, just because of the preaching of the Word of God, just the Bible and the Spirit of God and the foolishness of preaching, that's what the Bible calls preaching, foolishness of preaching, and it's talking about the preacher. And how many times I've seen individuals that could not be convinced of anything else with an atmosphere of the Word of God being preached, the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, and the foolishness of preaching brought to a place of repentance. You can argue till you're blue in the face with man's wisdom won't convince them. I don't know how many times since I've realized that I've had the opportunity to say something to people, you know what? The Holy Spirit of God is telling you this is true. And without my wisdom, without my reasoning, without my argument, I watch them go like this. Yeah, He is. He really is. Because that's God's power. Folks, if we could just come to the realization, the recognition, that God doesn't need our wisdom. I'm not saying be foolish. I know Christians that they don't study to show themselves approved. They don't know what the Scripture says about things. They believe something and then they set about to just defend it. I'm not saying that at all. But friend, that isn't where the power is. The power isn't in debate, isn't logic, isn't in argument, it's in the wisdom of God. The Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's verse 25. In verse 26, he says, You see your calling, brethren. He brings it down to really, really practical, a practical note because who is God calling foolish and who is God calling weak? The person sitting in your seat. The person standing in my shoes. God is calling foolish and weak. And that may not f make you feel just like you're being so well praised this evening, but I want to tell you something. If you have any maturity at all, it ought to give you some relief. You know, most of us, when we're trying to be wise, are mostly bluffing. It's true. Most wisdom's a bluff, isn't it? Hey, you want people to think you're smart and you're educated, but mostly it's a bluff. Isn't it true? I was reading last week, and this, this isn't terribly relevant. I'm not trying to pick at anybody. But I was reading an article last week where Ravi Zacharias, his, so a lot of his, uh, I, I always have thought Ravi Zacharias was pretty well spoken and uh, pretty well reasoned. But where his, um, a lot of his academic credentials are actually not real. 
it just they, they've examined his, his credentials and he actually doesn't have many academic credentials. And he's removed, he stopped claiming a lot of the ones he used to claim. But why would he do that? Why would Ravi Zacharias, who is very well spoken and presents very good arguments most of the time, why would he credential, overly credential himself? He wants to bluff, right? He wants to impress people that he's wise. That's why anyone would do that. And so, friend, the weakness of God, the Bible says, is stronger than men. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. Now, look at what God uses. Here's the comforting part. Here's where we want to get to and, and get finished with. The Bible says instead of that, though, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Now, again, if we had mirrors, we could look into them and say, aren't you glad God chose you? God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You ever see anything as aggravating as, um, <laughs> as a guy that just is very, very confident? I, there's something about a Christian who's confident in his faith and what he believes that just gets under people's skins. Not, not because he's being obnoxious or mean about it, but you know what I'm talking about? You ever meet somebody that hates God and they want to dispute with you and debate with you and they want to convince you there's no God, but you know there's a God because you know Him? And no matter what kind of nonsense they can spew at you, you just are just like, well, but there's a God. And I know it. I know Him. And God's Spirit lives in me and He's real. And there's just something about that that just is really unflappable. You just can't really shake it. A person that knows God. And by the way, that's why you ought to have a relationship with God. Not the only reason, but it's a benefit, isn't it? It's great to have a real relationship with God so that you know you know Him. There are a lot of scriptures that talk about knowing that you know God. There are things that you can do. You need to be in fellowship. And you need to be in the Word of God. And if you know that you know Him, it's a wonderful thing. You don't have to be wise to know God. And the Bible says, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Literally, the wise are scratching their heads and saying, why doesn't this go away? <coughs> why? You ever think about, in terms of unbelief, the, the frustration of the gospel to unbelievers? I used to love to read Tertullian's The Blood of the Martyrs, or his, his Tertullian, and I liked his statement in early church historian where he would say the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And what he was proposing was that every time you killed one Christian, ten people watched him and became Christians. It's like, you know, we're going to put a stop to this. We're going to torture these people to death and we're going to teach the world a lesson. And people would say, man, how could a guy die like that? How could someone, how could, so that's got to be real. And ten people would take the place of everyone killed. So much so that the Emperor Constantine, who was a pagan, who never trusted Jesus as his Savior, actually just started a religion called Christianity. It wasn't Christianity. It was, it was a pagan religion with apostate Christians at its helm. But he embraced it. How come? Why so? What? Yeah, because you can't beat them, join them. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world. And the Bible says, because the weakness of God is stronger than men, the, the, I'm sorry, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. You know, after you try to make it in your own strength, what do you realize? You can't. How many failures does it take in the life of the average Christian to realize without me you can do nothing is really what it means. Without me you can do nothing. We are weak. And my friend, the Bible says that God made a choice to use weakness. And God made a choice to use foolishness. And the beauty of it is that God made a choice to use us. Literally, you say, Pastor, I'm not too smart. Well, that's a good qualification to serve God. Well, Pastor, I'm not... 
you know, I just don't really have the fortitude. I don't have the strength. Well, that's a good qualification because God, by His grace, can do amazing things. Now, I did not here this evening propose to you that foolishness is, or that what God does is foolishness. No, God takes the foolish and gives them His wisdom. And God isn't weak. God takes the weak and gives them His strength. And my friend, anyone can have that. And then the Bible says the reason for it is that no flesh should glory in His presence. I don't want to skip over verse 28. The Bible says, "...and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not." Okay, you guys know what base things are, right? So not just basic. It means like underfoot. It means like below. God can use base things. God can use not just base things, but things which are not. That is nothing. God can take nothings. You say, I'm just a big nothing. God can do big things with big nothings. The Bible says, yea, and things that are not. For what purpose? To bring to naught things that are. And then the Bible says that no flesh should glory in His presence. Now, Christian, get this. Get this, get this, get this. This is where the rubber meets the road. If you want God to use you, you've got to get your motive straight. Many times, if God were to do something great with us, we couldn't handle it because we just couldn't keep from taking credit for it. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> right after that, you know. All I did was... You know, just brag a little bit. You know, it just came to me. I just had this idea. Really, that just came to you. I just thought, just talk about, you know, it really wasn't, it's nothing, brother. It was nothing. All it was. And they talk about how clever we are. You're not that clever. God did that. You know, God doesn't want us to glory in His presence. And if, if we can't have enough humility to say in our minds, in our hearts, ourselves, not, not these disingenuous words that say, you know, really, guys, really, it was nothing. <laughs> it's nothing. Nothing. All I did was. And they talk about what we did. But when we can actually say seriously, it's really obvious anything good that happened was not me. God did it. Really, folks. If you think I did that, you are seriously mistaken. Base, despised, nothing, foolish, weak. And if anything good comes from it, you just got to look to Jesus. And that's the reality. And you know, for some reason, logically, it makes no sense at all, but for some reason, we seem to be fine many times with stealing God's glory. We seem to be just fine standing in the limelight and being gazed upon as though it were us, that it were ourselves. We ourselves had done something incredible or amazing. When God's amazing and incredible, and we ought to know that because that's what we realized when He worked in us the first time. And God can use you. God can use you as long as you don't really think anything of yourself. I'm not here this evening to destroy uh, your self-esteem. That whole self-esteem thing is some of the silliest nonsense ever. Nothing has destroyed the human psyche more than the self-esteem movement. I believe that, honestly. People that believe in themselves. You say, Pastor, you sound like you're about to say something mean. No, no, not at all. I wouldn't do that. Realistically, though, who are you? What are you in comparison with God? And the answer is your wisdom and God's wisdom? Come on. Your strength and God's strength? Your glory and God's glory? How do we relate? Scale one to a hundred, less than zero. It's true, isn't it? 
And if you can come to the place where you find your worth, not in what you believe about yourself, but you find your worth in what God thinks about you. You know, some people, I mean, they just have to have friends and they have to impress their friends. I mean, they just spend their whole life trying to impress their friends. You know what God thinks about you? He thinks that you deserve hell, but that He loves you enough to invest His righteous Son in your place. In other words, God thinks of you as though you have inestimable worth. I said inestimable without adding a couple extra syllables. Can't do that. It wasn't me. God gave His Son for you. What are you worth? God invested the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, for you. That's how much God loves you. What's your value? How do you estimate the value of someone whom God has given so much for? Love, and being found in Him, not having our own righteousness. You ever examine that phrase and think about what it means that God finds righteousness in us that isn't ours? In other words, righteousness that He puts in us? It's pretty neat, isn't it? Well, how to get there? God put it in us. If I were to take Anthony's hat, can I have your hat, Anthony? If I were to take Anthony's hat this evening, it's not too bad a shape. You've had this two years, a couple years, a little while. Not too bad a condition, actually. But if I were to take his hat and use it like I use hats, mm -hmm. in about a week's time it would be covered in grease and probably have some rips and tears. It would be in pretty bad shape like all of my hats are. Probably the bill would have tears. And I don't know how that happens to my hats, but it does. If I were to do that, and then I were to try to auction it here this evening, not being famous, not having anybody's signature on it, what do you think the limit would be for the value of this hat? Throw, somebody throw a number out there. Ten cents. Ten cents. Okay, what if you're in a desert and you have sun on your face? Twenty cents. Okay. Yeah. Hundred bucks. Okay. So it can be a hundred bucks, right? Okay. Now the fact is to most of us hundred dollars is quite a bit of money. But realistically in the whole scheme of life, a hundred bucks comes, hundred bucks goes. Hundred bucks isn't that much. But what if I filled this hat with gold and auctioned it? How much more? You wouldn't really care about what the hat's worth, would it? A hat full of gold. I would be not you know, it'd be hard to hold. It'd be hard to lift. It'd probably be what? Probably 20 pounds of gold. Mm -hmm. And gold being what is it right now? An ounce. Is 1300. It, how much? 1300. 1300. So it's 13. Yeah, 13. I thought it was in the 1400s, but yeah, you're probably right. So gold's 1300 an ounce, 16 ounces in a pound times 20. What's it worth? <laughs> What's it worth? Plus the hat, <laughs> which is worth 100 bucks. <laughs> Thanks, Anthony. Okay, what's it worth? See, it isn't it isn't what the hat's worth, it's what's in it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And friend, it isn't what you and I are worth, it's what's in us. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. What are you worth? Just the fact that God redeemed your soul. What's a redeemed soul worth? The Bible says, what would a man give? Right? It, it would, it, what would it profit a whole man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So there's nothing in this world as we know it, in this really universe as we know it, that we wouldn't give for our soul. That's the value of a soul. So we're a redeemed soul filled with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You tell me what's the average person sitting in your seat tonight worth? You and I couldn't comprehend the value of it, actually, could we? Isn't it incredible that we would overlook that value and instead substitute 
our wisdom for God's, our strength for God's, our standing for God's, and somehow glory in His presence. And God can't use anyone like that. But if you will look in the mirror of God's Word and you will see yourself as God sees you, there's no question, there's no doubt about your value. You'll see that. And if you'll see what God can do with you, it won't be dependent on your wisdom or strength. It'll be God's. My friend, God can use you and you'll never believe what He can do until you see it. And when He does it, People are going to overlook you. That's what I want to finish with this evening. When He does it, people will overlook you. A few times in my life I've found this to be true. I've seen God use me and people didn't notice. Because God really did use me. And so why would you notice me if it's God that's using me? And my friend, that's a pretty incredible feeling. It's a pretty wonderful thing because we were created to glorify the Lord. And when He gets the glory, things are as they ought to be. And it's just a wonderful thing. It's a little late to start the year, but it's not too late to start today and tomorrow, is it? Would you glorify God this year? Would you just say, God, you get the glory this year? God's way and God's strength. Could you do that? If you will do that, could God do something with you? I think every now and again we just need to remind ourselves, you know, I need to not be noticed. I need to not be remembered. I need sometimes to not be appreciated. I need sometimes to not, as bad as it sounds, be respected. Because any of those things that are directed toward us are deflected from Him. My friend, that isn't how it ought to be when He's God and when He gave so much to redeem us. I think there's a lot of application there. Let's live in light of it. Father, thank You for what you, we've learned this evening. Thank You for a reminder, God, very, very plainly spelled out in the Scripture of what we actually are and the reason that You use unimpressive individuals like us God, help us to remember what we are and to glorify You and not to glory in Your presence. God, help us not to deflect the glory that should be directed at You. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's take some prayer requests this evening.